thank you all for coming back. I would like to introduce the chair of our next roundtable, Dr. Corinne Field. Corinne Field is assistant professor of women, gender, and sexuality here at the University of Virginia. She's the author of The Struggle for Equal Adulthood, Gender, Race, Age, and the Fight for Citizenship in Antebellum America, published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2014, and co-editor with Nicholas Surrett of Age in America, Colonial Era to the Present published by New York University Press in 2015. Field is the co-founder of the History of Black Girlhood Network, an informal collaboration of scholars working to conduct research into the historical experience of black girls. And she is the co-organizer, was the co-organizer, of the Global History of Black Girlhood Conference held at the University of Virginia on March 17th through 18th of this year. So UVA, a sort of hotbed of black feminist scholarship mm -hmm. and activism. Her current research investigates the history of generational conflict within Anglo-American feminism from the 1870s through the 1930s, focusing in particular on the deep connection between age prejudice and racial prejudice in arguments for women's empowerment. Field received her PhD in American history from Columbia University and her BA from Stanford University. She has been a fellow at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture at the University of Virginia, the Huntington Library, and the Schlesinger Library. Good afternoon. Let me just say how thrilled I am to have you all here today, and for Sarah for creating this community and allowing us to host you here at UVA. I want to thank um, Justine in particular, all of the organizers, but particularly Justine for all the work that she did to create this <coughs> remarkable event and help to make UVA a hot in the flag of this history. Um, this is truly, truly wonderful. Um, I also want to thank Deborah for hosting us here at the Wizard. Okay, I'm going to uh, introduce this just wonderful panel, of which I'm so honored to sit at this table today. Um, I'm going to go in the order on the program so that you can follow along there, which is not how, how they're sitting. So if you'll just raise your hand a little when I introduce you. Or you've got name tags, sorry. Okay, um, I'm going to start with <laughs> with Crystal, with Crystal Feimster, um, who is a native of North Carolina, an associate professor in the Department of African American Studies, the American Studies Program in the History Department at Yale University, where she teaches a range of courses in 19th and 20th century African American history, women's history, and Southern history. She has also taught at Boston College, UNC Chapel Hill, and Princeton. She earned her um, master's degree and PhD in history from Princeton University and her BA in history and women's studies from UNC Chapel Hill. Her manuscript, Southern Horrors, Women in the Politics of Rape and Lynching, was published by Harvard Uni University Press in 2009. It examines the roles of black women and white women in the politics of racial and sexual violence in the American South. She is currently working on two book projects, Sexual Warfare, Rape in the American Civil War, and Truth Be Told, Rape and Mutiny in Civil War, Louisiana. Under the table we have Cheryl Hicks, uh, who is an Associate Professor of History at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. She holds a BA in American History from the University of Virginia, and a PhD in American History from Princeton University. Her research addresses the intersections of race, class, gender, sexuality, and the law. She has published articles in the University of Pennsylvania Law Review and the Journal of the History of Sexuality. Her first book, Talk With You Like a Woman, African American Women, Justice and Reform in New York, 1890 to 1935, was published by UNC Press in 2010, and it received the 2011 Letitia Woods Brown Book Award from the Association of Black Women Historians and honorable mentions from both the 2011 John Hope Franklin Prize and the 2011 Darlene, Darlene Clark Hine Prize. Her current project, Black Enchantress, <coughs> Hannah Elias, Interracial Sex, Murder, and Civil Rights in Jim Crow, New York, explores the shifting meanings of interracial sex, racial segregation, criminality, and black civil rights <coughs> struggles in Gilded Age and Progressive Era America. She is the recipient of the 2017-18 Mellon Postdoctoral Fellowship in African American History at the Library Company of Philadelphia. Amrita Chakrabarty Myers earned her doctorate in US history from Rutgers University, specializing in African American history and women's history. 
a story of black women, her work examines the intersections of race, gender, power, and freedom. Dr. Myers has become the recipient of several awards, including a 2017 fellowship from the American Council of Learned Societies, the 2012 Julia Cherry Sproul Book Prize from the Southern Association of Women Historians, the 2011 Anna Julia Cooper C.R.L. James Book Prize from the National Council for Black Studies, and the 2009 Letitia Woods Brown Article Prize from the Association of Black Women Historians. Um, excuse me, I, okay, Professor Meyer's social justice work was recognized by Indiana University with the Martin Luther King Jr. Building Bridges Award. In 2014, she helped organize a symposium at IU on rights and retrospectives, the Civil Rights Act at 50. In March 2015, she was the lead organizer of It's Not So Black and White, Talking Race from Ferguson to Bloomington, a Black Lives Matter teacher. This past March, she organized a teach-in that highlighted sister scholar, scholar Kali Gross's work entitled Violent Intersections, Women of Color in the Age of Trump. Off-campus Myers is regularly interviewed by the media. She is a co-anchor for WFHB's African-American radio show, Bring It On, and is one of the founders of B-Town Justice, a community organization that functions as social justice information clearinghouse standing in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. Her first book, Forging Freedom, Black Women in the Pursuit of Liberty in Antebellum Charleston, was published by UNC Press in 2011. Dr. Myers is now writing her second book, Remembering Julia, A Tale of Sex, Race, Power, and Place. She is Ruth Ann Hall's Associate Professor of History and Gender Studies at Indiana University. Jesse Rainey, PhD is the founding director of the Women's Institute at Chatham University and associate professor of women's and gender studies. She is a historian of gender, race, working families, and US social policy. Her book, Child Care in Black and White, Working Parents and the History of Orphanages, was published by the University of Illinois Press in 2012, and it won the Lerner Scott Prize in Women's History from the Organization of American Historians the Herbert G. Gutman Prize from the Labor and Working Class History Association, and the John Hines Award from the National Academy of Social Insurance. She received a new faculty fellowship from the American Council of Learned Societies and the Iris Marion Young Award for political engagement from the University of Pittsburgh in recognition of her work <coughs> on public education policy. Dr. Ramey was also the founding director of the Undergraduate Research Office at Carnegie Mellon University, co-founder of Flying Pig Theater, which produced new plays by women playwrights, and assistant director of the New York Community Trust, Westchester Community Foundation, where she directed the Women and Girls Fund. She earned a BA with honors in social history from Carnegie Mellon University, an MA in women's history from Sarah Lawrence College, and an MA and PhD in history from Carnegie Mellon University. What a fantastic panel we have here today to talk to you about intimacy and interiority and the influence of Tara's work on these themes. Staff at the Carnegie Institute um, and everyone else who helped to make um, this symposium possible. Um, what a wonderful experience this has been. Um, I'm quite honored to be a participant this afternoon with so many scholars that I admire as we all celebrate the 20th year anniversary of Tara Hunter's To Joy My Freedom. The invitation is special in a number of ways, in part because it helps me reflect on the people and spaces that have guided me on my journey as a scholar. It is here at the University of Virginia that I made important choices regarding my connection to history as a discipline. As an undergraduate, I was a history major who decided to go to graduate school under the mentorship of Reginald Butler and Patricia Sullivan. <coughs> Reginald Butler continued to mentor me as a postdoctoral fellow at the Carnegie Woods Institute, where I discovered the title for my book, Talk With You Like a Woman, surprisingly from a lunch with Africanist Joseph Miller, <laughs> where I met and learned so much from Claudia and Harold where I engaged in so many generative discussions about my work from other fellows and faculty like Deborah McDowell. 
and where I began to understand the difference between revising a dissertation and writing a book. I discovered my book here. So coming back to a place that has shaped my professional trajectory in so many ways is awesome. But to do so as a way to talk about how Tara Hunter and her work have shaped my own research is a real gift. In so many ways, I've been incredibly lucky to have encountered mentorship along my career path. And to join my freedom, its focus, its methodology, its structure, its sources, its writing, and overall rigor helped me, helped to mentor me as a graduate student, as a new um, teacher in the classroom, as an assistant professor, and now as an associate professor. It may be weird to make that statement, but I knew her book before I knew Tara. Mm -hmm. My comments reflect just a portion of why and how I see this text as standing the test of time. I remember reading To Joy My Freedom for the first time in a critical moment in graduate school. I was two years into researching black working women in New York's criminal justice system. At that point, I had amassed a lot of documents, many of them prison case files, filled with narratives of individual women, um, but I hadn't quite figured out how to present them. When I read the book's preface, Tara revealed that her research taught her some of the fundamental lessons about how to research and write a history of black women. I knew that that was the experience that I wanted to share. Reading to Joy My Freedom provided me with a better sense for what I could do with these women's stories. The book showed me how black working, um, black working class and everyday folk um, were more important than the historiography has suggested. That putting black women at the center of the narrative forces you to ask different questions as well as interrogate sources differently. And that gender as an analytical tool alongside race, gender, <laughs> class, sexuality, and so many other important issues could be addressed by scholars simultaneously, just as they are experienced by other people being studied. While she tells us, um, Tara, sh while she tells us, Tara also shows us with incredible examples and analysis how African American working women were central to the New South's political economy. Although my research was not focused on Southern Black working women in the post Civil War era. As I wrote my first book, I had a better sense for how I could talk about black working women in the urban north during the progressive era. To join my freedom provided me with a model that helped me understand how to write about black humanity with sources that consistently contended that black people, and especially black women, were inhumane. I saw in To Join My Freedom a way to address these women's humanity, much like writer Toni Morrison and anthropologist John Walton's work took black people's humanity for granted. The book addresses not only black women's labors, but attempts to assess their interiority, their nobleness, their nobleness and flaws as mothers, lovers, fraternal members, religious devotees, consumers, political activists, and party goers. As I work on my second project, to, do, to Join My Freedom has continued to inform how I'm asking questions and interrogating sources related to the interiority of black women's lives and especially the intimacies that they experience. I'm particularly interested in what constituted black women's pleasure. <coughs> black Enchantress uses the personal experiences and legal travails of Hannah Elias to interrogate the meanings of interracial sex, uh, racial segregation, criminality, and black civil rights struggles in turn of the century New York. It examines the trajectory of a covert, consensual relationship that ultimately precipitated murder, scandal, and protest. In 1903, 39-year-old black divorcee Hannah Elias' sexual relationship with 84-year-old white businessman John R. Platt became public knowledge when prominent white resident Andrew Haswell Green, known as the father of New York, was murdered when he was mistaken for Platt, Elias's lover of almost um, 17 years, close to 20 years. Six months later, Platt charged that between 1896 and 1904, Elias blackmailed him for over $685,000. Wow. 
The case became more complicated when Elias's wealthy Central Park West white neighbors of three years discovered that she was black rather than their assumption that she was Cuban or East Indian or woman of some oriental race. Some even went as far to say that they thought that she was an oriental princess ex exiled temporarily from her own country. <laughs> as a result, my manuscript in progress grapples with many important questions. Why did a case about interracial sex receive so much local, national, and international coverage, and what can it tell us about racial, sexual, and ge in the gender landscape of Jim Crow New York? Instead of the press's initial portrait of the duped el elderly married gentleman, how does this case reveal a distinct perspective on 19th century sporting culture as well as white slumming, where men like Platt sought out interracial liaisons in the Negro tender mm -hmm. yeah. While many historical studies have examined this era's focus on the politics of respectability and black racial advancement, Elias's and Platt's affair raises new questions about black womanhood in the early 20th century, including questions about how women like Elias might have pursued personal satisfaction while accumulate, accumulating material benefits. And finally, what does it mean that established black leaders and everyday black residents use this case to highlight the social, political, economic, and criminal justice challenges they face within the city? So all black people were saying, she's immoral, we're not going to deal with her, but there are a number of complicated ways that they responded to the case. I want to emphasize that the extortion charges against Elias made the politics of silence impossible, um, as she had to talk freely about her and Platt's relationship to defend herself in war. Her choice to participate and profit from the sexual economy illustrates how she negotiate, negotiated her material ambitions and illicit desires. Her story connects with the growing black sexual economy scholarship by focusing on excavating the pleasure rather than simply <laughs> illustrating the pain in histories of black women's sexuality. Instead of addressing the intimacy between Elias and her white lover, I want to focus on two areas, motherhood and clothing or dressing up, that might tell us something about Elias' interiority and particularly how she experienced non-erotic pleasure. In doing so, I want to begin with a portion of a 1904 court testimony and her defense of her right to retain the money that she argued she was given. She reveals, I was born in Philadelphia. I had a little trouble there before I left. I've given birth in my life to three or four children, and the fathers of these children were not my husbands. I was at one time, I think, sent to jail from here, New York, this man, John R. Platt, has been supporting me for 20 years, and there has never been any fuss about it until this time. I am not worried. I have not done anything wrong, and I have nothing to fear. <coughs> Elias was born in Philadelphia in 1865. She was one of nine children. She and her twin, David, were the family's third set of twins. When she notes that she had a little trouble there in Philadelphia, and that she was sent to jail um, from New York, she also was admitting to two incarcerations, one in Philadelphia for theft and the second in New York for disorderly conduct. My following comments will focus on how I see um, these incarcerations as examples that indicate Elias's attempts at experiencing the pleasure of dressing up and clothing as well as the pleasure of motherhood. The Philadelphia arrest stemmed from what it seemed to be her fascination with clothing and dressing. Unlike Ellen, the house slave that opens chapter one of To Joy My Freedom, who violated that long established code of racial etiquette by wearing her mistress's toiletries, or Willie Mae Cartwright in chapter eight, who had had a good relationship with a generous, fashionable employer that could sell Cartwright good clothes or let her borrow certain items, Elias did not encounter the police as Cartwright did because they questioned whether her jewelry was stolen. Elias was arrested and imprisoned because she likely stole her employer's dress. In her youth, she was known for her beauty and perfect figure and reveled in ideas of a better life that included a love for fine clothes. 
For instance, Elias reportedly said to her sisters that times will change and I won't always be washing dishes. In 1885, her desire to adorn her working class body with beautiful clothing, or as one newspaper noted, gratify her desire to shine, led her to incarceration for several months in Philadelphia's Moya Mansing prison after she stole a splendid brocaded frock from her employer in order to appeal, appear well-dressed at her older sister Hattie's wedding. <laughs> Although Elias' family experienced indigence intermittently, which led to her employment as a domestic, it seemed that rather than pilfering the dress because of abject poverty, Elias sought the attention and pleasure she believed wearing such a garment would bring. Clothing, it seems, remained important to Elias, especially as a wealthy woman. And if you have $685,000, it's clear that you are, are wealthy today, <laughs> and especially in 1904. <laughs> it's clear in the portrait that Elias maintained a feeling that Hunter ascribes to her Atlanta woman that dressing in and of itself was fun and pleasurable. Newspapers consistently documented what she was wearing and described not only her clothes, but her jewelry, sometimes noting it as fashionable, but oftentimes using tired, stereotypical descriptions of the gaudy, ostentatious black body. This prompted me to really look at the clothes that Elias wore in the newspapers and as, his, as, as, as and a historian find out if it was really fashionable during that time period. Of course it was. Using visual culture methodologies and digitized fashion magazine in the US, like Vogue, and um, digitized um, uh, magazines in Paris, I've been able to identify some of the fashion trends that Elias wore in the courtroom. I imagine her to be like, to join my freedom, Susie Pride, and Minnie Freeman, and Savannah Bruce, walking into the courtroom like these women strutted down an Atlanta sidewalk with their multicolored dresses. While she may have been afraid because there were thousands of people in this courtroom in terms of onlookers, Elias uh, was confident as her brief words of testimony attest, even as she endured white, res white residents' anger. Their dismissive comments about her appearance only reinforced the fact that they could not prevent Elias from adorning her black body with clothing intended to enhance white elite women's bodies. Elias' second arrest and imprisonment in New York for disorderly conduct occurred because of her concerns about womanhood, or motherhood. In her eighth month of pregnancy, claiming that he deserted her, Elias followed Frank Satterfield from Philadelphia to New York City, demanding that he take financial responsibility for their unborn child. She had had a child with him in Philadelphia a year and a half before, and their combined poverty forced her to deliver in an almshouse, as well as give the young baby girl up to a local black couple. Mm -hmm. After their New York argument out of, outside of his workplace, they were both arrested. Elias was, only, was the only one in prison. She delivered her son in another public institution for the destitute, Short, shortly after her prison release, and that child, the child that she did not give up, died less than two months later. When thinking about her court testimony, as a 39-year-old black woman who faced difficult decisions with her first two children in her youth, Elias used her wealth to protect her two younger children, whom she suggested were fathered by a flat. One born in October 1902, but died five months later, and another was born in April, April 1904, two months before her trial. When jailed on, it, on the extortion charge, Elias exposed the injustice involved to the press by arguing, quote, I left a six weeks old baby at home, but she is being well cared for. I have left plenty for the baby, and I feel she will be all right. With the amount of wealth that she had, she had immigrant servants to take care um, of her child. Indeed, Elias could protect and care for her child in ways that had been impossible earlier in her life. Her sexual economic agreement and later relationship with Platt meant that she successfully used her erotic capital to access pleasure in myriad ways. We most often, oftentimes think of that intimacy that she experienced with 
um, men like Platt. But she also used that um, in terms of her ability to purchase material possessions, like jewels and clothing. She had four homes when she was taken to court. But she also acquired the ability to protect herself and her subsequent children from poverty and the indignities of racism, at least to an extent. Indeed, her wealth afforded her the opportunity to experience and enjoy various aspects of motherhood, even though she rejected a reunion with her first child, whose adopted father came to New York after he found out about her money, demanding that Elias give him money for caring for her daughter for 19 years. Elias was just as complex as many of the women Hunter studied as a domestic, um, because she was a domestic and she was poor. But she was determined to live her life on her own terms. Studying someone like her deepens our worldview of black working women, their material desires, their family connection, and their struggles to navigate the challenges of urban life. I want to end by saying to Joy My Freedom continues to mentor me as I work on new material. Rereading it inspires me to keep grappling with a project that at this point has more questions than it has available answers. I also have the joy of actually experiencing Tara as a fellow scholar and friend. Tara, you are incredibly generous, supportive, and kind. I say kind because I think in a profession like this that many people think that kindness means that you don't have rigor. And she has kindness and rigor. You have been my unofficial mentor for a really, really long time. Not just your presence, but also your body of work. I don't think you even know the first time that I knew about you. I was an undergrad who attended the Southern Historical Association meeting in Atlanta, Georgia, I think in 1992. Seeing you and so many other black women at that conference with PhDs working on black women, I knew I could do it too. Mm -hmm. What an absolute honor to be able to tell you in such a public way how integral your work and your support have been over the years. Thank you. circumstances. I, I didn't have the nerve to go to her house that evening. I was too scared. <laughs> I, I thought to myself, I can't even imagine how I would hold a conversation with her and all these other amazing people who were sure to be there. Um, and little did I know that a few years later, when I was going up for my third year review um, at my job at Indiana University, um, there were several people who were asked to review my then still really unrevised manuscript in progress. And Tara was one of them, and she very graciously um, accepted, and that's a lot of work, right, to read an entire, um, really still unrevised dissertation. And she was, her, the thoroughness and caring with which she read that manuscript at that point was amazing. Um, I not only got back a really supportive letter for my third year review for my file, but I got back 
several pages of notes and suggestions and ideas for how to revise and improve the manuscript for publication. And the, the advice that she gave me was absolutely critical because it meant that I was able to do those changes before UNC Press ever looked at the manuscript and before they ever sent it out to external reviewers for evaluation. And I've never been able to tell you how much I appreciated that. It was, it meant the world to me, it really did. And um, she, read the, she read the book, again, for my tenure file. Um, and she wrote for my tenure file, and so she was able to see the difference between that really terrible, unrevised <laughs> dissertation and the book that it eventually became. And she wrote an incredible letter for my tenure file, and um, if that book is half as good as people say it is, it's really due to the work that she put into it. Um, and the advice she gave me and the encouragement that you know, she gave me in terms of being able to um, revise the work. So I just wanted to thank you for I know we're here to honor your scholarship, but I think it's important to, that we also honor you as a mentor. Um, just the incredible amount of labor that you put in to us and those who are coming up behind and it's been a really wonderful example to me of not only how to mentor my own graduate students, but how to read other people's work and the time that I, you know, when even we're all busy and it's easy to say no, but I don't say no all the time now because I remember the people like yourself who have taken the time to invest in me and my work. So thank you so much for that. Okay, <coughs> a little emotional now. <laughs> so, the impact that Tara Hunter's work has had on my development as a scholar of Black women's history has been significant. I first read To Join My Freedom when I was a graduate student at Rutgers University. I was much younger then, and the book was brand new. It was also revolutionary. While historians today talk about writing narrative histories, engaging in what I call informed speculation, or casually comment on the fact that freedom is a contested word that means different things to different people. In 1997, when Tara suggested all these things, they were transformative ideas. Even more so because she had the nerve to state that newly freed working class <coughs> black women in the city of Atlanta did everything in their power to enjoy a freedom of their own design, as opposed to the more limited liberty that white Atlantans envisioned for them. Newly freed, southern, working class, black, women. In every way imaginable, the group that occupied center stage in Tara's book was the least powerful demographic in post-Civil War America. Many readers were shocked to discover that female ex-slaves actually had their own visions of freedom, let alone the agency and the intellect to breathe said visions into being. But they did. From finding their loved ones to quitting bad jobs, forming labor unions, going on strike, attending religious revivals, wearing colorful clothing, and dancing in juke joints, Black women in Atlanta lived each day determined to be free as they defined the term. They weren't interested in living under a system that determined who they could work for, how much they could earn, what they could wear, and how they could celebrate. That was far too much like slavery. To join my freedom was, in a word, riveting. Every 20th century black scholar I knew was grappling with the implications of this book for their own work. Little did I know how important it would become to my own. For those who may not know, my own research focuses on black women in the slave south. So what then could Tara Hunter's book have to do with the <coughs> women that I write about? Isn't her book about emancipated women? Isn't her analysis about contesting notions of freedom in the post-war south? While the answers to both questions is yes, it's a yes but. <coughs> yes, but Hunter's analytical lens is chronologically and geographically fluid. As I discovered when writing my first book, and then rediscovered as I'm now writing my second. The first book, Forging Freedom, examines the lives of free women of color in Charleston, South Carolina from 1790 to 1860. From chapters on manumission, employment, and property ownership to more intimate portraits of individual black women and their families, the book tells the story of how the city's free black women defended their rights as they perceived them from the early days of the Republic to the start of the Civil War. Whether it was asking the courts to formally recognize their freedom, shielding themselves against false enslavement, petitioning the state assembly to repeal race-based taxes, or filing lawsuits to protect their property, Charleston's women of color used every means at their disposal to protect their own definition of freedom. In doing so, they behaved in many ways like their postbellum sisters, women determined to enjoy a freedom of their own creation, as opposed to the more constrained freedom that white people desired and designed for them. Consider the story of Eliza Seymour Lee. 
1857, Lee initiated a lawsuit against fellow Charlestonian Henry Gordon. A respected businesswoman, Eliza and her husband, John, had owned the city's two most illustrious hotels for years, lodgings that catered to prominent whites from across the nation and around the world. By the 1850s, Eliza was a wealthy widow with ties to Charleston's white elites, and she oversaw her business affairs with the help of Henry Gordon, whom she hired to help manage her finances. A prominent attorney, Henry appeared happy to take Eliza on as a client. Their relationship soured, however, when Eliza discovered certain irregularities with her portfolio. Confronting Henry and getting nowhere, and determined to protect her rights, she sued him for fraud and embezzlement. Now, the outcome of the case seemed certain. She was a free black woman of the managerial class, Henry a white man from the professional class, and an attorney as well. <coughs> Henry was thus vested with more economic and social status than Eliza, a woman of color whose race and gender placed her near the bottom of the Southern power structure. One could thus assume that Henry would prevail. Eliza, however, clearly felt that she had the right to seek justice. She was intelligent, wealthy, well-connected, and her lawsuit indicated that she believed that she was a citizen of the state of South Carolina and thus entitled to the protections of the law, regardless of the fact that she was a black woman living in the slave South. The courts evidently agreed. Eliza won her suit, and Henry was ordered to make restitution to his former client. Now, it's true that Eliza was unusual in some respects due to her affluence. In other ways, however, we know what we know of her life and her lawsuit is reflective of the city's larger community of free black women. She started out as a very working class woman, right? She was trained in the art of food preparation by her mother, and her mother had once been enslaved, right? Her mother's name was Sarah Seymour. So Eliza begins her life learning her mother's craft, which is pastry making. So she begins life laboring around hot ovens, making and selling pastries on the street. She and her husband, eventually John Lee, um, you know, had enough money to begin, they opened up their own rooming house, boarding house. And what does Eliza do there? She cooks and cleans up after her tenants, right? It's only after years of hard work and determination that the Lees eventually saved enough money to open up Charleston's exclusive mansion house hotel. When I first began writing about Eliza Lee and the other women of Charleston, there was very little scholarship that addressed how free blacks in the early national and antebellum periods thought about freedom. There was even less on how black women envisioned freedom. It was thus incredibly useful to have Tara's book in front of me, like literally in front of me, uh, when I was thinking about things like citizenship, rights, privileges, power. Building on her idea about contested notions of freedom, I examined how women of color in the Old South defined freedom and how that was similar to and different from antebellum whites and postbellum women of color. What I, just, what I discovered was that for Charleston's black women, like those in Atlanta, Freedom meant much more than just legal manumission. It included earning a fair wage, attaining financial independence, living where and with whom they wished, and worshiping as they pleased. Additionally, Charleston's women of color were committed to securing the emancipation and autonomy of their loved ones, choosing who or if to marry, overturning race-based taxes, acquiring property, um, overcoming occupational barriers to, of race and sex, and attaining upward social mobility for themselves and their children. Seen from this perspective, it's clear that for black women, official freedom was never an end in and of itself. More than just a fixed legal category, freedom in the antebellum, in antebellum Charleston, as in post-war Atlanta, was an experience. Manumission without the ability to secure meaningful employment, amass financial resources, purchase homes, consolidate familial security, acquire clothing and jewelry with which to adorn one's body, attend the church of one's choice, and improve one's overall social standing, was a poor imitation of liberty. It was the benefits of freedom that black women desired. And to see their visions become reality, black female Charlestonians worked hard. They constructed alliances uh, <clears throat> with powerful persons, and they sought the protections of the law that white Carolinians enjoyed as their birthright. Even though the judicial system was not oriented towards alleviating their predicaments, black women still appealed to the courts and the state assembly in a myriad of ways to further their quest for fuller freedom. They signed petitions, created trust agreements, submitted affidavits, filed lawsuits. In language and behavior, they drew on ideas of citizenship in order to request equal protection under the law, just as their descendants would do in post-war Atlanta. Despite their best efforts, we know that black women in Charleston were not always successful in their quest for expanding rights, privileges, and freedoms. 
Whether they won or lost their individual battles, however, it's important that free black women in the Old South, like their sisters later in the century, believed that they were entitled to certain things, including the protection of their bodily freedom and the defense of their property, and that they used every tool at their disposal to expand the parameters of their freedom. Savvy political actors, Charleston's black women refused to reside silently within the boundaries of a pseudo-freedom created for them by the master class. Instead, they articulated their own vision of freedom in the face of social structures created to define and contain their rights. Given the story that it tells, forging freedom occupies a space between the history of enslaved women and that of post-war freedom. And it's thus part of a link in our overall understanding of Southern black women's history. Tara's work on the post-Civil War South posits that black women's experiences under slavery influenced the ways in which they later viewed the concept of freedom. She outlines how Southern free women seeking control over every area of their lives struggled to dictate not only the terms of their labor, but also their modes of dress, worship, and recreation. Historians of slavery who came later, such as Stephanie Camp, <clears throat> would later conclude that enslaved women undertook this sort of resistance as well, working to control their bodies, clothes, homes, worship style, and leisure time while still on the plantation. Forging Freedom maintains that free black women in the Old South were equally impacted by their experiences with slavery, which affected not only how they saw freedom, but how they worked to bring those visions of freedom to life. Their stories that are the next chapter in the history of enslaved women, and a precursor to the experiences of free women in what is actually a long history of Southern black women's struggles for freedom, justice, citizenship, and autonomy. But the fact that we even understand this today is only because of the contributions first made by To Joy My Freedom. This is why I continue to assign Tara's book to all my students, undergraduate and graduate. Its relevance has not faded with time. I discovered this anew when I recently visit, revisited to join my freedom while writing my second book. Set in rural Kentucky in the early 1800s, this project examines the life of one woman of color and her two daughters within the context of an interracial household, a relatively isolated farming community, and a state committed to upholding <coughs> both racial slavery and patriarchy. This isn't the Eastern Seaboard South. It's not an urban area. There isn't a large community of black women. But the framework continues to hold true. Rural, isolated, enslaved women of color like Julia Chin still work to build autonomous lives for themselves that did not conform to antebellum white Americans' visions of black female freedom. Refusing to adhere to con contemporary social standards about black women's appropriate place, Julia rode in a carriage in defiance of antebellum race and gender customs. She was also baptized at and attended a white church. And she opened up her white husband's plantation when he was in Washington, D.C. Her partner, Richard Johnson, was a congressman, a senator, and eventually vice president of the United States under Martin Van Buren. In addition to her work to expand the parameters of her own life, she also worked to ensure that her daughters went further than she herself could. Both of her daughters were educated. They learned how to play the piano. They sat with their father's white guests at the table when they came to visit, and these guests included the Marquis de Lafayette and President James Madison. Julia also helped to arrange marriages for her daughters to local white men and made sure that her husband transferred substantial real property to their daughters when the girls married. The pushback that Julia and her daughters experienced in their efforts to build free lives for themselves makes it clear that contest contestations over black female freedom in America have a long history. While many locals ignored the Chin Johnson Union or tolerated it to a certain extent, there were limits to that acceptance. An example of this was when daughter Adeline was barred from the county's 4th of July celebrations one year. According to angry newspaper accounts, Adeline took a seat, quote, in the pavilion where the ladies were assembled, which did not go over well with those in attendance. Asked to remove his daughter, Richard, who was said to be furious, put his daughter in his carriage gave his speech in a very hurried fashion, that's why the family was there, and then left, refusing to stay for the festivities. <coughs> the senatorial election of 1829 was another moment when white Americans took issue with Julia and Richard's union. Consider that Richard lost his U.S. Senate seat that year, um, that was 1829, the same year that his older daughter, Ima Jean, married a white man named Daniel B. Pence. It's true that his district returned him to the U.S. House of Representatives the following year, and that he served in various political capacities until he died in 1850. 
one could conclude then that Richard's relationship with Julia and his willingness to take their daughters out into polite society didn't hurt his political career. Still, the well-publicized church wedding of Imogen Johnson to a white man appears to have been too much for white Kentuckians in 1829. Right? There were several angry newspaper articles written about this wedding and about her sister's wedding three years later. Um, the gloves came off, it was very ugly. I'm not gonna read, I had one of those articles, but I'm not gonna read it, I'm just gonna go to the conclusion because I'm out of time. But the newspaper articles and editorials made it very clear that rural white Kentuckians accepted interracial sex in some ways, so long as the persons involved in such relationships didn't defy certain social conventions. Power and privilege only went so far, even for a family of a wealthy, slave-holding white male politician. In Scott County, Adeline stepped over the line when she attempted to take her place in the same tent and thus on the same social footing as the community's white ladies. White male voters drew another line in the sand when Imogene married Daniel Pence, and then again in 1832 when Adeline married Thomas Scott. The incidences and the angry letters and editorials they generated from the press provide us with clear evidence that contestations over black female freedom in America have a long and often ugly history. I would posit, however, as I continue to write this new book, and examine the ways in which Julia and her daughters pushed back against the constraints that white Americans crafted for them, that a close look at the history also reveals the resilience that black women have always shown in the face of white attempts to constrain their ability to enjoy their freedom. Thank you. Joy and pleasure in this particular moment. 
Um, so this is what I looked like when I first met Tara. Um, I was just out of Sarah Lawrence College. Uh, that's my oldest. He's probably the most important thing I produced in grad school. Then. <laughs> and he's actually with me on this trip visiting the University of Virginia now. He's a junior in high school, so he's looking at colleges. So that I feel very old. Um, Tara, you haven't aged at all. It's only uh, it's um, So I was extraordinarily lucky uh, coming out of Sarah Lawrence to move back to Pittsburgh uh, to start working with Tara at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and of course, I knew she was special, but I didn't really know how special until I started reading from my comps um, and looking at all of this historiography. Um, and that was more than a little intimidating when you're reading, you know, book after book after book after book. Uh, and I realized this is actually a picture of one of about six bookshelves in my office now. And I, just to fact check, went and looked in just about every single book that's been published since 1997 in our fields, right? African American history, women's history, Southern history, labor history, all sites, Tara's book. Uh, and I'm pointing at it up there, but it's a great company, right, with all these wonderful books. Um, so, you know, it's clearly had an impact, and I love to see the ripple effects um, with all of us here today, and um, so many of us uh, producing and sort of reproducing these questions in our work. Of course, Tara's had a huge impact on me, uh, working with her as my dissertation advisor. I really got interested um, in the way that oppressed people have found ways to use what's available to them as forms of resistance, um, and for their own purposes. So I wound up writing about orphanages and how <coughs> black and white poor families use them to take care of their children uh, while negotiating with the institutions to make them function in the way that they need it. Um, and Tara was already working on bound and wedlock at the time, and I was really inspired by her focus on families, on marriage, on um, children, and defining what meaningful freedom really looks like and thinking about that in my work. Um, and my project won three national awards uh, and was published by the University of Illinois Press. So I'd just like to pause again and say publicly to Tara, thank you. Um, you made that happen. That is really a reflection um, of you. And I don't think that's the best picture of the two of us, but that's the one I had <laughs> from one of the awards I won. So there it is. Uh, so repression and resistance. Right? I want to share with you some of my current work that I think really continues in this vein. Um, and I do a lot of what I call scholacticism, sort of merging scholarship um, and activism together. Um, so I thought I would just share three examples with you. Um, I do a lot of work in education justice, and that's really become the subject of my current book project, which is terrifying because I'm trying to write something that's very recent. It doesn't feel very far in the past. Um, and I'll share a little bit of that story with you. But that's something I'm struggling with. Um, I'm also an observer participant in that story, which is also a very different format um, and genre of writing that I'm accustomed to. So it's a scary project. <coughs> um, and I'll also talk very quickly about some gender policy work that I'm involved in, um, and then most recently, some legacy work that I'm trying to do to honor women of color in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and all of this work is really informed by the lessons that we've learned from black feminist history, right? And really drawing on things like, and I'm not going to talk all about this, but I just want to acknowledge, right? Really centering versus simple inclusion, um, thinking about <coughs> equity versus equality, intersectionality, of course, um, and really I use social justice as my critical lens in all of my work. Um, so those are some of the key ways in which I approach my work that I've learned, obviously, from Tara. All right, so this book project um, is wrestling with some very recent history that I got involved with when I was working in education justice. Um, in the state of Pennsylvania, back in 2010, we had a wave of Tea Party elections right across the country. And our Governor Corbett came into office promising to slash education, and that's exactly what he did. He cut about a billion dollars from public schools the very first year in office. Um, and it had a huge and immediate impact on students. So students across the state lost about 30,000 teachers. Um, they lost art and music <coughs> and after school programs, uh, transportation, full day kindergarten, like anything that wasn't nailed down, right? It was just absolutely devastating. Um, and of course, these cuts hurt our poorest students who were disproportionately students of color. Um, and most of this really compounded existing inequalities within 
um, these institutions or, or public schools. <laughs> and I became really active in the education justice movement. Um, and I started writing this blog, which I called Insertion, and if you're not from Pittsburgh, I can explain the meaning of the name later. Um, and people love teasing me about this blog because it's fully footnoted. So this is the only blog I've ever read that's like full of footnotes. Uh, but that was really important to me. Um, writing quite a bit about education policy and how it connected to what I was seeing happening at the local level. Um, and New Education really became a hub of activism. And we had a steering committee that did a lot of work on the ground organizing sort of rallies and all kinds of things. I'm going to show you some pictures in just a minute. Um, and the whole thing became really big. Right? I had thousands of followers in social media. I had a national audience. Um, I got invited to President Obama's White House twice to talk about national education policy. Um, so this was all very exciting and very national and very unexpected um, for a historian. This was not you know, the kind of project or the kind of writing that I was used to doing. Um, so my current book project is trying to tell this story, which is really about a parent-led, grassroots uh, civil rights movement that unseated the governor of Pennsylvania. For the very first time in Pennsylvania state history, we unseated a sitting incumbent governor, um, which is amazing. It's a huge victory. It's very much due to the hospital's <coughs> work of the parents. Um, and we actually made education a voter issue for the first time ever in the state of Pennsylvania, and it was the number one voter issue. That's how we got him out of office. So in the book, um, I look at what I call the sort of perfect storm of neoliberalism, white racism, and several other historic factors coming together. Um, and I'm really trying to use these lessons of uh, black feminist scholarship to connect all of these dots. Um, so I talk about things like mass school closures, privatization, union busting, deindustrialization, high stakes testing, right, and trying to put all of this together. Oh, look, I made an animation for you. <laughs> <laughs> this is like so exciting. Oh. <laughs> so I won't talk about all of these sort of storm clouds, but this is sort of what I'm trying to wrestle with. It's, um, you know, lots and lots of pieces and pulling all of this together um, and really trying to put parents, and particularly black women, at the center um, of this story. So I dialect repression, persistence, thinking about this. Um, I thought you might want to see what resistance looks like in this story, and this is why um, I jumped up to show you some pictures, so thank you for bearing with me. But I think that really getting a chance to see what resistance looks like is important, and so when I talk about this work, I like to show who's doing it. Um, this is also a very gendered story. So as we know, women are at the heart of most social movements um, throughout time, throughout our country, around the world, right? And no different in Pittsburgh and across Pennsylvania, these are some of the leaders. Um, so women are very much at the heart of this story. Um, and really in the, at the heart of everything we did. And I'm not going to stop and talk about all of these things, but I just want you to get a sense of you know, how much activism was going on here sort of in this four and five year period I'm talking about. So lots of rallies. This is the first one I produced. We had a snowstorm that day. It was 20 degrees, and it was outside. I learned not to schedule outside rallies in February. But 200 people showed up. Um, we had a great turnout. Uh, lots of things like this was a candlelight vigil for our teachers with um, poet Terrence Hayes up there reading to our kids and to our teachers, all of these laid off teachers. Um, a lot of our work went viral. This was an operatic <coughs> rally that was held. Um, this particular article that I wrote about this event um, wound up getting coast to coast coverage, which was really exciting. We can talk about that more. Um, this is another. Uh, campaign that really went viral. We had empty library shelves, so I've been really involved in school libraries um, and thinking about the disparities and why. They're almost like the canaries in the coal mine in this story. Thinking about books and librarians is really important. Um, and you know, really pulling together artists and poets. Uh, this is Vanessa German there at the top. A lot of our faith community involved in this work. Um, and really highlighting and centering what was going on with our arts in our school. This is a rolling rally we held around the city trying to forestall school closures. We actually, in Pittsburgh, held off another wave of school closures. We had a lot of victories here, which were great. Um, I helped to co-found a coalition of faith-based leaders, 
uh, labor leaders and community organizations into this new coalition uh, called Great Public Schools Pittsburgh. And we did a lot of big national work, including bringing in uh, Diane Ravitch, the historian who allowed us to launch her book, uh, which was great, with made a thousand people there, and picked up a lot of national interest. Uh, the former New York Times columnist, Bob Herbert, actually included three chapters in his latest book on our movement. Um, and I think he did a great job, but I need to write more. So it's not that I don't think Bob did a good job, it's just that I think we need a larger treatment of the history. Uh, and so lots of victories, and I won't go through all of these now, but uh, it, you'll have to look, learn more about all of these wonderful things that we managed to do. So let me just mention very quickly two other things um, that are sort of related to all of this activism and scholarship that's been going on. We've had a big victory in the city of Pittsburgh. We passed CEDAW legislation. Um, if you're not familiar with CEDAW, it's the Convention to End All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Uh, there's really a grassroots campaign in a lot of cities to pass local legislation. And I was tapped by city council to come in and give expert testimony and sort of about the history of inequality and what that looks like intersectionally. So, you know, tapping a lot of those skills um, as a historian to come in and have that picture of me testifying before city council. Um, and we successfully got this legislation passed just last year. So we're getting a lot of this work off the ground right now. Um, and then earlier this fall, sort of Pittsburgh has been having its own conversation about statues, very much related to all of the national conversations going on. Um, so we're talking about tearing down um, a local statue that's very problematic. And I've been thinking about, well, why aren't we talking about putting statues up and the fact that there are no women on the statues in Pittsburgh? Um, and I wrote this full page article in the Post-Gazette suggesting we better start putting these statues up and we better start with women of color. And I uh, nominated seven women of color from history and wrote little um, biographies of the seven people that I thought would be a great starting point and it got a lot of attention. And just earlier this week, our councilman, Dan Gilman, called a bunch of us into his office and said, let's make it happen. So this is gonna be exciting work if we can get it off the ground fast. So that dialectic of oppression, resistance. Mm -hmm. And I thought I would just wrap up with a couple of thoughts about the future. Um, I think this is really interesting, actually, that Lisa mentioned um, in the earlier conversation, the National Women's Studies Association conference. Because um, this is actually, I agree, where I think a lot of exciting work is sitting. So I was also there two weeks ago, at least I didn't get a chance to see you. Um, and I think some of the most exciting resistance is actually happening among our students, particularly um, high school students, um, undergraduate students that I work with. This is actually historian Elsa Barkley Brown at that conference um, with the Baltimore Youth Organizing Project. Mm -hmm. And these kids are knocking it out of the park, mm -hmm. right? So I think this is some of the history that needs to be written, but I really think this is where some of the, the best energy is. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was at another panel at the NWSA conference with historian, that's historian Lisa Dugan moderating. The panel was called State Killing Queer and Women of Color Manifestos Against U.S. Violence and Oppression. Uh, the manifestos were stunning. They really were stunning. And I was so moved by the words of one of these young emerging scholars that I asked if I could share her words as a way to close with you. Um, and she agreed they're actually going to try and publish their manifestos. Uh, but she agreed that I could share a, as an act of centering. I'd like to close um, with her words. Uh, Caitlin Gunn is a PhD candidate in feminist studies at the University of Minnesota. She's second from the right up there in that photo. Watch for her, she is amazing. Uh, and while I'm sharing this short piece uh, from her, I just want to leave you with this line of poetry. Uh, many of us have been talking about this. This is actually quoting a line of poetry from Pittsburgh poet Toy Derricote. Um, I was at City of Asylum last weekend, and this is on a gate outside of the garden. City of Asylum is a refuge for writers, international writers. Um, and of course, I was really struck by what we learned from Tara about looking at spaces of joy and pleasure um, as forms of resistance. And this is what Caitlin Gunn is asking us to think about with joy and resistance and radical speculative fiction is what she's thinking about. I'm a huge sci-fi fan, so this resonated with me um, as a way of imagining Freedom. So after the 2016 elections, uh, Gunn was really upset. She was talking to her mother, who told her, quote, that we as black people are particularly good at surviving conditions we were never meant to survive. 
Black people can endure the unendurable. And Gunn says, this is the narrative black women so often hear and repeat about ourselves. Survive today. Make it until tomorrow. Even your presence here, now, in this space is transgression and resistance. That narrative has grown less comforting to me, she says, mm -hmm. particularly in the midst of palpable terror about what the future for people of color, for queer people of color, for immigrants, for women, for femmes. We are deeply out of the practice of radical speculation. So Gunn asks the question, how do we make it through a living dystopia without romanticizing survival? Mm -hmm. um, she argues that we have to get rid of the language of simply surviving and deserving mm -hmm. And that we need to orient towards a radical reimagining of the future. And Gunn says, quote, I center black feminist resistance to draw on the rich tradition of black feminist resiliency and vision. Black feminists are long in the practice of radical speculation, speaking to futures where we are free, where our liberation is a necessity, and where black lives matter. White power structures and white supremacists are not the only ones who can create alternative facts. Our oppressors bend reality, they twist it and resist it. We must not forget that we have mastery of resistance, that we know how to breathe our lives into the cut out spaces that have been made for our deaths, that we can find pleasure and struggle. We lived an alternate history that would be readily erased. We must create alternate futures outside of their gaze, just for us, by insisting that we reject Standalone narratives of black women's survival as resistance. We want, must want more for ourselves, more pleasure and more resistance. Train yourself to think about impossible and improbable futures. Remind yourself that yesterday's impossible futures are often reassessed as a prophecy. This practice of radical speculation is a refusal to give up those futures. It's Kate Lincoln. I think beautifully summarizing as a young and emerging black queer scholar um, much of what we've learned from Tara and what we've heard today. So we're a little behind in time, which I apologize for. We're going to have time for um, two quick questions. But before that, I just want to take a few seconds to just add words on what's been said. And maybe flag the um, scope of your work outside of the U.S. So when Lakeisha Simmons and Abbasade George and I said about organizing the Global History of Black Girlhood Conference here, it was so striking how people working on Africa and Europe and the Caribbean are taking for granted that understanding the history of black girlhood requires understanding joy and pleasure and embodiment. So I just want to thank you for opening really that world of scholarship to people. Um, and with that, take uh, two quick questions. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. I just have a first comment. Wonderful um, discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I tried to choose a range of women who were artists and uh, educators, and uh, they were all super inspiring. It was super difficult to narrow that list down, but I'll t just tell you one name. Um, if you have a wallet with you and you have any coins, you were probably carrying a piece of her art, um, and that's Ms. Selma Burke, who was an artist who did a lot of work in Pittsburgh, and she designed the sculpture that eventually went on the dime. So if you have a dime in your pocket, you will carry a piece of Selma's work. to have a, a comment, and I'll try to make it quick. It comes from um, Cheryl Hicks, and again, thank all of you, this is a spectacular panel. Um, Cheryl and Amrita, because what all of you have been saying, even in the earlier panel, that Tara's work not only gave you a model of how to do history, but Tara's life and her being gave you a model of how to be as scholars in wherever we ply our trades. And so I simply want, because we have many students in our midst, I want to reinforce the importance of two things. One, that 
Should I stop? No, no, I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> the two things, one that Cheryl Hicks mentioned about the importance of rigor mm -hmm. and understanding that rigor and kindness are not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. I have seen many students make many mistakes because they do believe that if someone is demanding something of you, they are being unkind to you. That the greatest compliment any teacher can pay you is to take your work seriously enough to read it, to edit it, and on occasion to ask you to revise it. That is not unkindness, all right? The second thing is saying yes. We who make it and have made it and are on our way to making it through what can often be the alienating space of academia need to understand the importance of saying yes. There is much energy in the current generation not to caricature anybody about my work. And my work, for many people, often means I don't have to do anything that helps to maintain the day-to-day -day unglamorous quotidian work of the day-to-day -day work that has to be done to drive this business we're in. And so what you have to say about the importance of saying yes to assignments that are not necessarily directly connected to your own work. But we need to reconceive, I tell this to our fellows all the time, we really do need to reconceive of and have a radical revaluation of what we consider our work. It includes that which appears on articles under our names and books under our names, but it also includes the number of ways and, and, and um, practices we must be engaged in to sustain this work that are about advancing the work of others mm -hmm. and carrying out the day-to-day -day unglamorous work of being in the business we're in. So mm -hmm. that's just the comment I want to make.